hey, Fluffer Schnoots, I'm back. And we're going to finish up that whole VMware thing. So let's pop open VMware Player. If you're new or if you've been following along, in the last video we installed VMware Workstation 17 Player. This is a free tool that is provided by VMware to use to create high-performance VMs that run and feel pretty much native. And I've said that a couple times and you're about to see it. So, if you want to create a VM, you go to create a new virtual machine. But you won't get far without an ISO image. You could actually use a physical drive, but we're going to get an ISO image. You could also just create the virtual machine and then install the operating system later, but for this demonstration, I want to use Windows 10, and for that, I need a Windows 10 ISO, and I have one. But it seems like my network share is being really flaky. Come on, now. Ah! Oh. Why is this happening? All right, so right out of the gate, running into network troubles. Not a good sign, but pretty much on par for an EG video. Okay, finally it shows up, and public is where I need to be, that's it. So there's our Windows 10 ISO. It really shouldn't have been this hard. If you want a Windows 10 ISO, you'll have to go to the internets. I think back in the day, Microsoft actually used to provide Windows 10 and Windows 11 ISOs. I don't know if they still do, but, oh wow, it's going to take 20 minutes to copy this over my network? That is... lame. It's copying it about 6 megabits a second. I mean, do you think SneakerNet is faster than this? Let's find out. Okay, I finally successfully completed the SneakerNet, and I'm going to copy the ISO straight into the home folder, and there we go. The SneakerNet is officially faster than my local intranet. Dang. I even had to reformat this thing because this ISO is 5 gigabytes. Wait, why does it say it's 700 gigabytes? Something's wrong. Okay, so my sneaker net was faster, but it seemed to suffer from data integrity issues, and I don't know if this is a KDE. Like, this is a bug. I'm not sure what's going on, but real quick, I copy the ISO from my local home folder onto a 32 gigabyte USB 3 USB stick. Dolphin says that it's done, but when I go to dismount or unmount it or whatever, it, it sits there and holds up. If I force it and then re-enter the USB stick back, it's the wrong size. So it's almost like when I copied the file onto the USB, it was actually copying it onto a cache that wasn't actually written until the USB was removed or the file system was removed. I'm not sure what mechanism is causing this, but fascinating nonetheless. And so now when I copy the ISO over, remove the old one, put the new one there, it's gonna be the right size. And now when we go to create a new VM, we can browse to the home folder, which pops up in the background, very convenient, and grab that ISO. 6.1, it should only be 5.7. Boy, wouldn't a checksum be handy here? We don't got time for that though. Let's go ahead and open it up and get it going. When you create a new virtual machine from a Windows ISO, VM Workstation actually detects that it's Windows and it gives you an option of different versions to install. I think that these ISOs are like all in one, and since I don't want to deal with bloatware, we'll just go with Pro. You guys probably know at the N and workstations and stuff. I actually don't know a lot about Windows, so maybe Pro for workstations is the way. Since this is just a demo, I'm going to create it as a base bare bones thing. Personalize Windows, um, no password, I don't. This is just for kind of convenience. So you, my use case for this would be for like some gaming, like um, I just I guess I call it gaming, Windows gaming maybe. For what it's worth, Windows 11 would probably work just fine too. But I believe Windows 11 forces you to create a new Microsoft account. Windows 10 doesn't. Now Windows in general is a pretty chunky operating system, and 60 gigabytes is probably okay if you don't plan on doing much of anything else on there. If you're going to do gaming, then I'd probably say like 120. But this machine actually doesn't have a lot of space. It only has 80 gigabytes available, so we can, we can probably work with 60. It'll be fine. You always want to store it as a single disk, not across multiple files. It actually says right there why you would do uh, one or the other, so you just want to store it as a single file. At the end, you can customize your hardware, and I suggest you do because there's some things that you can change here to make it run better. Now, the memory you give it is pretty much up to you, and this system has... Oh, this doesn't tell me. 
Okay, this system has 16, it has 14 gigabytes available. So two gigabytes, I could probably kick it up to eight and probably be okay with that. And then processors, this system has how many? Okay, it doesn't have 32, but it's actually the cores. So like your system might have uh, 16, it might have eight, it might have four. I'd say four is the minimum for Windows. Otherwise you really start running into performance issues. If you don't plan on using devices like sound cards and things, I just remove them. Printer, I have no use for that. I'm dropping it. And then the display by default, it's pretty okay. I believe this matches with whatever you provide it with in, in the memory. You can tweak with this a bit. You could change it to maybe two, one, or just leave it at the recommended. I don't know if it's actually gonna give it all eight gigabytes, but I don't really touch this. And once you've customized it or not, hit finish. It's gonna create the disc and everything else, but I'm gonna leave this open in the background so we can kind of see what the performance is. And we're done. Fires up automatically. I actually didn't think it would do that, but... Oh, it aired out, really? For real though? Oh, I guess I had two of these open. Oh, it didn't save it either. Wow, this was like a total crash and burn. Interestingly, my system's still working kind of hard. Oh, because I'm, well, it's probably not because I'm recording because it wasn't working hard before that. There it goes, yeah. So whatever process was happening in the background, it stopped. So VMware will create a folder at wherever you've pointed your VMs to go, and you can actually find the VMX file and double click it. And on KDE anyways, it's associated with VMware. So if it was working properly, it would have actually just launched the VM. So a cool thing that you could do is change this to look like maybe a game icon. And you could configure your VM to just like open up and then drop straight into a game. Kind of a cool like VMware player hack you could do. But for some reason it's not working at all. Okay, so it created a new line item for it, but it just starts and stops. So let's take a peek at the logs, I guess. Scroll to the bottom. What do we got here? Unknown errors, boy, that's good. Ooh, interesting. AMD V is disabled in my BIOS. Okay. So I'm recording this through OBS locally, which I think is kind of cool, but I won't be able to show you the BIOS. If I was recording it in another way where I was using my capture card, I'd be able to, but I, I don't want to make this any more complicated than it needs to be. You can see down here, I've been recording this one little clip for 23 minutes, Ugh. but whatever. Let me go into the BIOS and fix that and we'll try again. And we're back. And one cool thing about KDE is that it automatically recovers your session or at least like opens up what you had open before. But I've enabled the module in my BIOS and I suppose I should probably add something to the description to talk about how I did that and I will. Back in the day I had a Medium publication where I would post stuff like that and maybe I need to do something like that again. But let's see if it works. VMware player recommends four gigabytes of system swap space. Oh, that's actually a good point. We can talk about that. Okay, I'll deal with that in a minute. So you can see Windows is getting running in the background and it should be fully automated because we're installing it through VMware. When you first launch it and get things going, it'll pop up removable devices and some other stuff. Texas Instruments, I don't know what that is. It seems to be internal to VMware. I guess it could be my hardware, but I don't worry about it. So I just close it. And yeah, I think from here, we just like kind of sit and wait for it to get everything running. So let's talk about this swap situation. Wow, we don't even have HTOP, really? Okay, so I bet we don't have ZRAM swap. Dang, I'll, you know what? I'll save that for another video. ZRAM swap is um, just, it's something, it's really something that's best for another video. So we'll, we'll deal with swap later. And it hasn't even been that long. It's restarting after, I guess, installing. Like, that was really fast. Logo is gone. We got a spinning wheel. It hasn't asked me anything, so I think that it's just going to drop us straight into a brand new Windows. Okay, getting devices ready. Starting services. What do we got next? It's going to be the desktop. Ooh, there's a spike. Yeah, look at that. System's working its butt off. Did it say installing some updates? Whoa, this is the biggest network spike yet. Look at that, 8.4 megabits a second. I also wanna point out with all of this going on, like it's clearly installing and setting up updates and stuff. It's not using much memory at all. Okay, getting Windows ready. Don't turn off your computer. Cool. Now, interestingly, it, it did an upload. There was some upload stuff there. There it is, EG, welcome, with the old Windows 10 background. 
default background. Isn't it control to get out of this? But it actually seems to go back and forth just fine. That might be tricky for uh, games and stuff. I have never messed around with network connectivity between a Windows VM and VMware and the host and other systems on the network. I believe that you can go to the machine settings and change this from NAT to bridged or host. No, to share it with just your host, you would do host only, but you wouldn't have like internet connectivity, I don't think. So bridged is what you would want to use if you want to make this more like an actual computer and have your modem or router like issue an IP address so that other machines can connect to it. I haven't done this in a while, so I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's how it is. Anyway, I don't think it actually affects that. So, oh, it's gone. What happened? Okay, well, that's gone. So looking in the background, we're still only using 2.3 gigabytes of memory, but either way, that's actually like really impressive. Okay, enough about that though. So it's using an awful lot of CPU and it automatically resizes the display when we go into full screen mode, which is cool. The overall CPU activity is lower and yeah, so let's go ahead and try to install Chocolatey. Oh yeah, this is orders of magnitude better. So sounds like I need to do another video showing you how to like tune up your VMs and make them all run good. But in, in the meantime, I'm gonna wrap this video up with, um, you can make that go away by clicking the pin thing and you hover up and bring it back down. Sometimes it doesn't work all the time, so I like pinning it. But anyway, yeah, Chocolatey is a really cool little package manager tool for Windows. It's like Scoop. I think Scoop is probably more popular, but I'm old school, and I, I use Chocolatey way back in the day, and if I use Windows systems, I always reach for Chocolatey because that's what I know. Oh, right, it requires admin mode, so let's do that again. There we go, and then Chocolatey has a cool GUI that you can use so you don't have to run everything from the command line. If you do... If you want to, it's just like Choco install and then the name of the package. And there it is, the Chocolatey GUI runs in admin mode. Has a cool little logo splash screen thing. And it behaves an awful lot like simple package manager front ends like Synaptic or Muon or something like that. It tells you what you've already got installed, Microsoft.NET Framework. And if I want to install something like, say, Steam, does a quick search and bam, there it is. And then all the applications like Steam. So I don't think that you will find Windows applications here, like from the Windows Store, but non-Windows applications such as Steam, such as Chrome and so on, you'll find them here. A cool thing about Chocolatey is it installs everything in the background totally hands-free. And there you go. This is the first Steam prompt I've seen. When you install apps through Chocolatey and not just like downloaded EXEs and stuff, they show up here and it automatically searches for updates so you can update all of your straggling apps in here too. But yeah, this isn't a video about Chocolatey or Steam or anything like that. This is a video about getting Windows running in VMware and we've done that. So now we can push the pause button, suspend it, and come back to it at a later time. It'll pick right back up where it left off. So if you're in the middle of like... I don't know, word processing or a game or something like that. It suspends it just like you suspend a computer and it brings it back up. So it's pretty handy. So I guess this is where I leave the video. I don't really have anything else to say for this one. Up next, I think we might take a look at ZRAM and swap space in general. Hopefully get some better performance there. And we got to try out some gaming, like maybe some games that don't run on Linux. Roblox is one... I think Paladins, Dead by Daylight, some games like that. Let's see if we can get them running in a Windows VM. Now, the system specs on this machine are not great, so the performance may suck, but let's see if we can get it running. If you like this video, be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and if you really super like the video, you can become a YouTube member of this channel. I guess a channel member, huh? But either way, I appreciate all your support, and thanks for watching.